Hey, and welcome back to the exciting part four conclusion to the basics of Adobe Captivate for educators. Let's get started. So far, we've looked at simple manipulation, insertion of objects, things like that using Adobe Captivate. But what really makes Captivate engaging and exciting for learners is the interactivity. So now let's take a look at how we can make Captivate an interactive experience for our learners. What we want to do is actually create navigation from these items on the main process page, these images, that will navigate to the subpages, the pages that correlate, so that when they press on the cloud for condensation, they can then go to the page with the cloud condensation and back and forth. So it's easy to do that kind of navigation. Let's see how we can do it right now. What we're gonna do is insert a basic transparent button. And to do that, we go up here to interactions, choose interactions, and then button. Once you've chosen the basic button, you're going to see it appear here in the center of the screen. Now that button is cool, but it's not really the same as having them click on the cloud. So what we'd like to do is have them click on the cloud. To do that, we want to first make sure that the style is selected in the property inspector. And then you'll be able to see this. It should say transparent button. That's the one that we want. We're going to remove the text. I'm just going to select it and delete it. And then finally, we want to change the opacity of this button to be completely transparent. So to do that, we change the opacity all the way down to zero. Just type zero in the box and hit the enter key. Now you can see we have selected a nice little blank box. Now to work effectively in Adobe Captivate, the next thing you need to learn about is the timeline. So I'm going to go down here to the timeline. See at the bottom, this little word timeline, just click on it and it'll open up the timeline for the entire project. Here we can see all of the items that are on our screen expressed as items that correlate down below here. For example, if I click on this one, text caption 15, I'll see that that is the precipitation text caption. Now, one of the things that can happen is that our images or our text captions could easily get kind of accidentally clicked and dragged and moved around. So Captivate gives you these nifty little locks that you can use to lock things down. Now, when I click on a lock once, that's called a soft lock. And a soft lock will actually lock the item so that I can't click and drag the item around the screen anymore, but it doesn't lock the item for editing. So if I wanted to change the way precipitation was spelled or maybe alter the font or something like that, I could still do that with the soft lock engaged. But in my case, I actually want precipitation to stay and I don't want to change it because I like the way it's spelled. So I'll click this again. And in the second case, I get a solid lock. Now the object simply cannot be manipulated at all. I can't even select it. Here's a hot tip. If you find that suddenly you can't select something, it's probably locked in the timeline. Just open the timeline and make sure that you unlock it using the lock element. Now I'm going to go through here and actually lock the images and the text captions, each of them one at a time. And I suggest that you do that as well. You might be wondering, hey, all these items are stacked up in the timeline. What's this thing on the bottom? The thing on the bottom is the slide itself. Now, you don't want to lock the slide itself or you wouldn't be able to do any editing at all. Also worth noting, you can adjust the height of the timeline by clicking here and dragging upward. You might have to practice a little to make that little drag maneuver. I know sometimes when I'm dragging, I accidentally choose the slider and end up moving my image back or forth. So just be careful and drag and practice a little bit and I'm sure you'll get it in no time. Now up here at the top is one item that I have not yet locked. And this is the special item, it's the button. Notice when I select the button here, it also selects the button here. And that's how I can get that button back even though I can't see it. Now, when I am ready, I'm gonna take this button and I'm gonna move it up here on top of my cloud. You might notice on my screen, there's a little green 
line that appears. And that's because Captivate's actually able to help me with alignment by showing me that that top of the button was aligned to the bottom of that water cycle caption. Now I'm clicking and dragging, and I'm just moving this button and increasing the size of the button so that it covers the whole cloud. Once it covers the whole cloud, I'm gonna be pretty happy with it. Now here's a trick to understanding the timeline and how it works. Um, if you've never worked with a timeline before, it might seem a little bit confusing. You see these little numbers here, zero, one, two, and three. By default, Captivate sets your slide for three seconds of time. And when it plays that time back, it actually moves this little playhead across, moving it from the left side to the right side. So at here, you'd be at one second into your slide. And by here, you'd be at two seconds in. And here, at the end of the slide, you'd be at three seconds. Now, when you add an interactive item, like a button to a slide, you're actually adding a pause automatically. So when you add a pause like that, you actually want to be careful about where you put the pause, or you want to make sure that you react to the pause appropriately. By default, pauses are placed at one and a half seconds into the slide. So just keep that in mind. Most of the time when you're navigating, you either want to use a jump to, to jump directly to another slide, or a go to, to go directly to another slide. Keep in mind, if you decide to do something like continue, it means that even though somebody pressed a button, when they got to that moment in the timeline, one and a half seconds in, that would actually cause them to continue slowly, moving across the entire timeline. Now you might wonder, well, why do we need a timeline if everything is basically the same? And well, the answer is because you don't have to have everything the same. You can actually have things appear, and disappear, or even move on your screen. So you can control when things appear and where they are and how they move and all those kinds of things. All right, so we've got our button and we're almost ready, but let's go ahead and copy that button three more times so we have other buttons for each of the other objects. I'm just gonna use that same shortcut, Control C on my PC or Command C on my Macintosh and then Control V to paste. And I'm gonna do that actually three times. So I've got three copies of my finished piece. Now I see a problem that just appeared for me uh, as I pasted my button and you'll probably have that problem as well. Notice that I've got an outline around each of those buttons that's still visible. It almost blends in with the sky, but not quite. It's a very light colored blue. That outline is called a stroke, and it's the line that goes around the outside of an object. Now, you'll see here that in my styles, I've got a stroke assigned to this particular button, which is a size three. So let's just go backwards. We're going to undo our previous action. And you can do that a couple of ways. The shortcut to undo is Control Z. So when I press Control Z, notice how each of those buttons goes away. The reason I did that is I know that I want all the buttons the same, and it'll save me steps. Now I can go to the stroke panel, and I actually want to type in the number zero, and then hit the return key. That way I have zero stroke, no thickness around that element. So there's no outline at all that's visible around that outside shape. Now I'm ready to do it again. I'm going to control C and control V. And if you're on a Macintosh, remember to use the command key. So I've copied that item now four times. If you're not sure you've copied it four times, just look in that timeline and you'll see four copies of the button. Now I actually want to take my copies of the button and move them into their respective places. So I'm going to grab one and move it to its new home. And then I'm going to grab the next one in the stack and I'll move it over to its new home. And I'm resizing them to fit. As I go, you should do the same. I'll grab the next one in the stack and I'll move it over here to surround the precipitation. And the last one I can leave exactly where it is. Now, like everything, it's handy to name these things so they're easier for you to find and figure out later. If you wanna name your buttons, simply click on the button, and then over here, choose the name, and instead of calling it button two, which is the default name, we're gonna call this 
condensation button, just like that. And so name each one of those buttons and then you'll be ready to move on. Now, the next thing to do is to make the button actually interactive. So I want my condensation button to lead to my condensation page. All I have to do then is choose the actions tab. Remember we chose the actions tab before, but this time it's the actions tab while I have the button selected. Remember the property inspector is context sensitive. So anytime you choose something that determines what will appear in the property inspector. Let me show you what I mean. When I choose the whole slide, watch the property inspector. Now there's the master slide and the other properties we're used to for the slide. Now I'm going to choose the button. I choose the button and what happens? Now I see the actions for the button. So what I want to do is when they click the button, that's called on success. When they click the button, I actually want to jump to a new slide. So I'll click jump to slide. And then Captivate needs to know which slide, so I'll click on the slide dropdown. And of course, I want the condensation button to go to the condensation slide. The last thing I want to do is make sure that I click on hand cursor just like that. That will make it so that when they roll their mouse over the top of the button, they'll see a little hand and they'll know that it's a button. All right? Now, move to each of the remaining elements, choose the jump to the jump to that's appropriate for each one of those. Here's my precipitation and then click on the hand cursor. Work your way around and do each one in sequence and then you will have navigation for each of those elements. Here's my transpiration. Don't forget to hit the hand cursor. Whoops. There we go. And one more time for evaporation. We'll choose jump to slide. We'll jump to the evaporation slide. And then finally, we'll click on the hand cursor. Now we're almost done. We've done a pretty good job. This should now automatically navigate to each of those slides. To preview our project, I'll go here to the preview menu and then choose preview project. Now we'll be able to see the project in action. Here you can see our first slide, explore the water cycle. Now, if I want to navigate on this slide, I can use the navigation play bar that's automatically been added. I click on play and move ahead. Now I can see each of those elements. And notice as I roll my mouse over the top of one of our invisible buttons, I get a little hand cursor. I can click on condensation and go to the condensation page. But hey, our students might be a little confused. They get to this page and they'll see all of this and they'll say, well, I don't know how to give back. And on this page, it'll be fine for them to go back using just the back button. But because of the way the project is set up, if they went to transpiration and then tried to use the back button, they'd end up at precipitation. That doesn't seem quite right. So I think we need to add a button that exists on all of those slides that takes us back to that primary navigation page, this one. The water cycle. Let's do that now. So I'm switching back to Adobe Captivate and here I'm going to go to my first condensation slide and there I want to add a new button. So I'm going to go up here to the top and choose interactions and then button and I want a button that actually becomes a back button. Now it's fairly simple to create. All I really have to do is go to the style section and here where this caption says button, I just want to say back, just like that. I could say home or any such thing. Now I can move this button over and simply put this button on the lower corner of the slide and that way I know it'll be in the right position. Now finally, I want this button to navigate back to that main cycle page. So I'm switching to the actions tab and then here, instead of go to the next slide, which is the default behavior of a button, I'm actually going to choose to have it jump to a slide. And in this case, I'm going to have it jump to the process slide. So it'll go back to that navigation slide. Now we've got it all set up and I'm simply going to copy it. Remember control C on a PC or command C on a Macintosh. Now I'll move to my next slide and paste the same button there and the next slide and the next slide. And now I've got the same button 
it has the same control, it jumps to the same location. So when I preview the project, I'm easily able to go back to the project. And from here, we'll move to the process page. There on the process page, we'll be able to actually control the navigation. We can go to evaporation and back, go to condensation and back, go to precipitation and back, go to transpiration and back. I hope you've enjoyed this short series of lessons on Adobe Captivate. For more information about Adobe Captivate and how you can create great e-learning with Captivate, check out our website at blogs.adobe.com slash captivate.